Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pastor Tom, and for those of you who don't know me, I uh, am the senior pastor here. You've been able to meet some of the other staff and our worship team people, and uh, we're excited to be together today. I want to thank those of you who are joining us online as well, and uh, thank you for giving us some of your time as uh, we go through this Sunday together. Also, just a short little announcement. I was handed a set of keys a while ago, and it is for a Dodge vehicle. And so um, I don't want another vehicle. Like it wasn't, this is your vehicle now. It's uh, maybe one of your set of keys. So they're gonna be in the front pew just over here if you find out that you don't have your keys. Okay, so please uh, feel free to pick those up after the service as long as they're your keys. So uh, we'll keep it like that. Today we're going to be talking about something that I used to joke about quite a bit. And that was in our young adults group that I grew up in. We had a fairly large young adults group in the church in which I grew up. And this particular verse that we're talking about today was a joke. But we soon learned it was no joke. The verse is on the front page of your bulletins if you had one. And it's just the first, have one, it's just the first phrase. And the verse is, wives, submit to your husbands. Now, among my friend group, I don't think we seriously thought about that phrase. We just used it as guys to preach to the girls. You know, the Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands. Then we would probably like, manipulate the verse to say, that means women, all women should submit to men or whatever we did. And the girls would have clever comebacks for the guys. And we didn't think really seriously much about this because we weren't married, so, you know, it was kind of a joke. And then Lori and I got married, and we had to make the usual adjustments that come in the early years. But I can't remember this verse coming up a lot in our marriage. And then we moved to a new church. And we soon discovered that a couple there faced serious marital difficulties that included abuse. And I was suddenly thrust into this ministry situation, trying to minister to a husband and a wife. And the worst verse, wives submit to your husbands, was no longer a joke, and it was no longer something theoretical. This was a real situation. And it did not make sense to me to say to an abused wife, wife, go and submit to your husband. And so began this 30 plus year journey since then of trying to figure out what this verse means in practice. And we come to it in our Colossians study today and I recognize wives submit to your husbands goes completely against our culture today. Many see it as a relic from the past that needs to be discarded and dismissed if the church wants to remain relevant. And a verse like this tests our view of Scripture. Do we believe that everything the Bible asserts is true? Do we believe it must be followed regardless of our emotional likes, cultural customs, or popular opinion? Or do we think that we need to modernize, correct, or ignore the Bible? in certain places. Verses like this also are a challenge because of the misuse of them, used to justify abuse or dominating authoritative rule. So how do we deal with it? How do we come to terms with it? And I realize I'm a guy, I am a husband, and though I can try to imagine what it is like to hear this passage as a female, I'm not a female. Now, I do have two daughters and a wife who have helped me gain some perspective. And I asked Lori again for her perspective on this a couple of weeks ago. She gave me some very helpful insight and, and thoughts on the matter. But I still don't know what it actually feels like to be in the skin of a woman and hear this command. So I thought I'd invite a female that many of you know, or at least recognize, to talk about this 
today. She is our music team's director, Kaylin Hamm, and Lori and I had the privilege of walking with Dan and Kaylin through their premarital counseling. And then I had the privilege of officiating their wedding over four years ago. And I thought it might be helpful for you to hear from Kaylin about her journey with respect to a verse like this. So Kaylin, would you come forward at this time? Says it's on. Oh, there we go. Hello. Great. Kaylin, could you tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey and your upbringing, your family, a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I really love the picture of maturing in Christ because I grew up in a Christian home. So in a lot of ways, my maturing as a woman paralleled my maturing in Christ. I moved around a lot. My dad was with the RCMP, so when I was really little, we moved. But my parents always made sure that we were very involved, very connected with any churches in our community. Uh, I have a lot of family who are in vocational ministry on my mom's side, um, mostly within the Nazarene church. When I was about 12, I was baptized, and it was actually Pastor Justin who baptized me just back there. And when I graduated high school, God called me to attend Vanguard Bible College for a year, which is a Pentecostal college, so it was quite different from my upbringing, and it stretched me in a lot of new ways in my faith. Uh, it was very instrumental, though, I believe, in building a strong foundation for where he called me next, which happened to be a liberal arts secular campus at McEwen University, and I was there for four years. It was a big change, needless to say. Um, and it was an, a time of accelerated growth in my relationship with Christ, and especially in reconciling my faith with the world and the brokenness that I saw around me, uh, particularly among my own generation within their sexuality and their interpersonal relationships. And I'm very thankful for SVBC. I've basically grown up here. I think my family came when I was in grade five, and it's been home for me for a lot of years. I work here now, and the part that everyone is probably most interested in is that I met my husband, Dan, here, and like Tom said, he married us right about, right about here uh, four years ago, which has been a big blessing. Okay, so you grew up in different churches. You ended up here. You met your husband here. By the way, we should get a finder's fee for that, and you haven't paid that yet. Church works, guys. Go to church. <laughs> Um, but you inter interacted with people from different walks of life and belief systems. And a verse like Colossians 3.18 that we're looking at today is totally countercultural. So when you guys decided to go ahead with marriage, you knew you'd be taking on this role of wife. And would you share some of what you went through in processing a verse like this? Well, let me first start by saying I have had a very difficult time. Uh, with this particular verse and verses like it. I do not have all the answers. I do not pretend to have all the answers or understand everything perfectly. And so if you have a different opinion from me, that's okay. Uh, I think a lot of strife can come into our churches with topics that are as heated as this and as widely debated. So we first need to start with humble hearts and with gentle words which is not something I always did when I first started working through this. <laughs> and I still really struggle with the practical application in some of this and taking the, the theory and, and applying it. But we can't just ignore it. So I really appreciate that you're taking the time to look at these difficult verses and not just skip right over them, even hope nobody notices. <laughs> but to this verse, um, I do have some thoughts. So wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. That word, submit, is a very provoking word. And I think an idea like this can read very poorly when we cherry pick it out of the Bible and present it by itself. However, if we take the verse in the context of Colossians and in the context of the Bible, um, the entire book of Colossians, we've seen it, Paul is very concerned with right living and with right relationships in our lives. 
Earlier in chapter three, he tells us, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and to put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. In Philippians, he tells us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. And in Ephesians, he says to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I think we have to take everything in context, and overall, we see that our God is very concerned with loving each other properly and acting in a way that is worthy of Christ. So submission is about honoring Christ by setting aside my preference, my comfort, and my pride, which I have a good dose of, <laughs> to serve each other. And as a wife, I think particularly, we wives are called to be aware of this within our marriage. I'm supposed to be humble, not insisting on my own way, not tearing down my husband and speaking poorly of him, but building him up in love. And I think uh, this verse can also act as a warning. I've seen marriages where there is a lot of strife. The wife is overbearing and argumentative. The husband is harsh or unkind. And these verses speak against that. It's about self-sacrifice, about serving each other. The same sorts of things that Christ calls us to do in all areas of our lives. So it's not really a new idea for wives. It's just we're taking it and we're applying it to our marriage. And it is countercultural, but so is Christ. Hmm. Um, have you thought about or seen ways in which this verse has been min misapplied that makes it maybe harder for women? Yeah, definitely. You spoke already about kind of the biggest one, which is the potential for abuse. Uh, and this is a very weighty consequence of not rightly applying a verse like this. And I think it's important to notice that Paul says, wives, submit yourselves. He does not say, husbands, make your wives submit to you. So it's a different sort of tone that he's using. It's not about control. It's not about power in marriage. It's about conducting ourselves in a Christ-like manner towards the person we have become one flesh with. The verse also says to submit as is fitting in the Lord. So submitting to sinful things like abuse would not be fitting. Second thought, <laughs> submission doesn't mean that you can never disagree with your husband. And if you talk to Dan, you're gonna find that out. <laughs> Uh, and it's not really the same thing as obey. It's not about following orders. It's about yielding yourself in love. Uh, and the third thing, it doesn't mean, women, that as soon as we get married, we become complacent wallflowers who just have to wait for our husbands to tell us what to do because we lose our brains as soon as we say, I do, or something like that. It's not about that. Proverbs 31 gives us a really clear picture of a strong wife. She feeds and she clothes her household. She sells, she buys land, she makes smart business choices. She works hard, she's generous to the poor. She is clothed with strength. She speaks wisdom and faithful instruction and she fears the Lord. And it really, it grieves my heart that our modern church talks about biblical womanhood often only within the context of marriage and submission. Because when I was young, I felt quite lost because the verses mostly focused upon for biblical womanhood were the submission verses and I didn't understand them. So how was I supposed to grow as a woman of God? And being a daughter of our heavenly father, can is, it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's multifaceted. And marriage can be a part of that but we risk missing the beauty of the gospel applied to our lives and the self-sacrificial love in all areas, marriage being among them. And as women in cultures of confusion, we can't miss the forest for the trees. We can't hyper fixate on this verse that maybe we find difficult and hard to understand and only think about that verse and, and just miss the rest of it, miss the renewed life that we're supposed to live 
because we get caught in the murky details and the interpretation, we are first and foremost called to a deep and abiding relationship with Christ. We are told to be transformed, to not conform to this world, to grow in love and purity and serve others, to be faithful to our Lord. And marriage is only temporary. There's not going to be marriage in heaven but our relationship with our Lord is eternal. So we don't want to downplay our life as a Christ follower being the most important and then applying that most important part to our marriages. Well, that's great, the thoughts that you have had. Lastly, um, where are you at today with a verse like this? I admit, um, practical application of this is, is difficult for me. So uh, I'll try to give you an example if you're also someone who's like, this just doesn't make sense. How, how do I do this in my life? I think in my marriage to Dan, submission plays out in my life as a kind of deference. I don't go making decisions on my own and just stubbornly plowing through regardless of what he thinks or his wishes. And I don't want to do that. I want what is best for him. And I value his judgment and his wisdom. So why would I not ask for it? And I've used this scenario uh, in speaking with people when I'm like, I don't understand this. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> and I say, well, what if there's just a point? There's just this big disagreement and you, you can't figure out something together. You can't agree on it. Well, does the wife just have to submit and just let the husband make the decision? And I've argued this point a lot, despite never actually experiencing it in my own marriage. Um, but I began speaking with other Christian couples like my parents and my in-laws and you, whose marriages I really respect and I would want to model my own marriage after. I'm really not sure that this situation does come up where the husband just gets the final say, regardless of what the wife is feeling, because that is not the model of the type of loving relationship that Paul is expressing to us. It isn't the type of love that Jesus characterizes for us. So maybe that does happen, and if it works for you, then I mean, by all means, do what works for you in your marriage, but I haven't found that yet, um, and I'm not sure that's specifically what Paul is saying here. And before I got married, I will say, for those of you who are young and not married yet, I had more problems with this than I probably should have. I had a lot of fear wrapped up in it and a good dose of pride <laughs> regarding these kind of verses. But since being married, what seemed like a problem to me before has really practically worked out in my life with a lot of joy. And I don't go through every day thinking, oh, I have to submit to my husband. But I am going through my marriage thinking, how can I love him better? How can I serve him better? Um, so, yeah, it just, I had a lot of problems with it. And then I got married, and I didn't think about it again until you asked me to come and talk, and then I had to really think about it again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kaylin, for sharing with us today. That's really helpful. And thanks for sharing your journey as well. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. So now we're going to look at the passage. Colossians 3, 17 to 19, page 836 in the Bible so that we have here. We're going to read the passage, and then I'm going to give you six factors that will help give context to Colossians 3, 18 and 19. And then we'll look at the command to both wives and husbands. So Colossians 3, verses 17 to 19 says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So six factors that help give context to Colossians 3, 18 and 19. Number one, 
God created males and females in his image. This comes from Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and 1 Peter 2, 9. Some have taken a verse like this and used it to claim that husbands are spiritually superior to their wives in the eyes of God. Some may even say things like, the husband is the priest over the home, but this is not backed up by scripture. So let's go back to the beginning in the first chapter of the Bible where God creates the first man and woman and listen carefully to what he says. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, let us make man, and that means mankind, humankind, in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God, verse 27, Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So males and females bear the image of God. And it's not like God gave males 100% of his image and females 80% or 50%. Both are image bearers of God. And in the New Testament, husbands are not raised up as priests over their homes above everyone else. God certainly calls them to take on responsibility over their homes and families. But in 1 Peter 2, 9, we see all our priests. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you, everyone, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And Paul himself will write in Galatians 3, 27 and 28, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So God created both males and females in his image, and men and women are spiritually equal before God in his eyes. Factor two, both man and woman rebelled against God in the garden resulting in a curse on their relationship. And you know the story. The serpent who was the devil comes along to Eve, raises doubts about God's character, and she responds to the devil's temptation by eating the forbidden fruit. And of course, insensitive guys will say, it's all Eve's fault that we're in this mess. Yet Adam was right there and fully participated in this act of disobedience. And immediately, their relationship with God and each other experiences fracture. The Lord comes along to meet them, and they hide from him. And then when he asks what happened, they start the blame game. This ultimately results in a curse on all three participants of this rebellion, the serpent, Adam, and Eve. And in Genesis 3.16 we see a diagnosis of the struggle we all face in marriage, if we're married. Genesis 3.16 says, To the woman God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And here's the key phrase. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So the last sentence describes the curse on marriage. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, which means the wife's contrary desire refers to a competitive spirit with her husband. She will naturally want to go against him. And he responds with harsh rule. He shall rule over you. Is not God affirming that that's the way it should be. It is the sinful response of the husband. He will rule harshly and in an exploitive way over his wife. And Tim and Kathy Keller comment on this in their book, The Meaning of Marriage. They write, in Genesis 3, both man and woman sin against God and are expelled from the Garden of Eden. We immediately see the catastrophic change in the unity between man and woman. The air is filled with blame shifting, finger pointing, accusation, 
And rather than the otherness becoming a source of completion, it becomes an occasion for oppression and exploitation. One of the results of sin is that husbands will seek to tyrannize their wives and women in general. Which leads to factor three, which is married people throughout history must struggle to overcome this curse. And that includes married people who follow God. And this explains the many dysfunctional and troubling things that we see in marriages, especially in the Old Testament, where husbands mistreat their wives, rule them harshly, and some wives try to manipulate things to outmaneuver their husbands. So we must not look at the marriages in the Old Testament, especially as models to imitate. They portray the effects of the curse upon marriages. They point to our need to depend on the Lord to overcome this. Number four, and perhaps most important of these six points, Jesus turned common understanding of authority and submission upside down through his life and teaching. So in Jesus' time, authority was exercised with the top-down approach, where the one with authority told everyone else what to do and expected unconditional obedience. This applied to the Roman emperor, to the Roman officers, to the Roman senators, to business owners, and to husbands in their homes. They expected obedience, and they seldom showed respect to those under them. Submission was shameful. If you had to submit, it revealed your low status. But Jesus turns this all upside down. He will teach the disciples a new understanding of authority and submission. And Mark 10, 42 to 45 is a critical passage on this. It says, and Jesus called then to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus introduces the concept of servant leadership. And then he demonstrates it with his own life, totally countercultural to the type of leadership that was practiced in that day. But Jesus also shows that a healthy submission can be honoring and glorious and not degrading to the one who submits, because he does this in his relationship with his Father, with whom Jesus is spiritually equal. Throughout the Gospel of John, for example, we see the clearest case of Jesus' equality with his Father. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, Jesus, was God. So he was distinct from God, he was with God, he was equal to God. Yet Jesus emphasizes throughout John that he has come to do the will of his Father. John 6, 38, for example, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Philippians 2, 8 says Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus turned the world's understanding of exercising authority and submission upside down by the way he lived and through his teaching. Number five, first century pagan culture practiced widespread male authority and female submission with no consideration of equality or no category for equality in some sense. And sometimes people present the Bible as if, well, you know, it's the Christians over here and the Christian husbands that are harshly ruling their wives in their homes while the Romans and Greeks and everyone over here are living with the same egalitarian equality standards that we have in the 21st century. That's a complete misrepresentation of the reality of that time. Rome did see the family as foundational to the empire, 
but it was all about control. Rome wanted to maintain control of the empire, so they emphasized a husband must have complete control over his home. And so you exercised authority down. You expected you would be obeyed without question, just like the Roman emperor expected subservient states to obey without question. There was no equality of all people under Caesar, but there was equality of people under Christ. And then number six, these commands have a distinctively Christian flavor. And one argument put forward to dismiss these commands goes something like this. Well, the culture of the day practiced male authority and female submission, so Paul is just counseling Christians to follow the culture's practice to ensure Christianity didn't get stamped out by being too revolutionary. Well, these commands have to be read within the context of husbands and wives being spiritually equal before Christ. And unlike the culture of that day, these commands show concern for the weaker party. As we will walk through the rest of this passage in future messages, there is concern shown for wives, concern, concern shown for children, concern shown for slaves, which was totally countercultural again for that time. Notice as well, these commands come immediately following the statement we read earlier in verse 17, whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. So there's a Christian context on these commands with a desire to glorify God. And with all of this context and history in mind then, we can look at these commands. First of all, wives submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord in verse 18. The word submit refers to a willingness to put oneself under the authority of another it is a willingness to abide by the will of another. And the Apostle Paul writes the word submit in a way that the subject does the action with respect to themselves. So it is submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And just as Jesus voluntarily submitted himself to his father's will, a wife is to embrace that command in her marriage. But this in no way means she becomes a doormat or has no say. And it also does not mean she sub must submit to something sinful, like the situation I was dealing with in that, that I told you about earlier. And I'm going to quote Tim and Kathy Keller here again from their book, The Meaning of Marriage. They write, no human being should give any other human being, especially as adults, unconditional obedience. As Peter said, we must obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. A wife should not obey or aid a husband in doing things that God forbid, forbids, such as selling drugs or physically abusing her. If he beats her, the strong help that a wife should exercise is to love him in her heart and have him arrested. It is never kind or loving to anyone to make it easy for him or her to do wrong. Notice also the contrast in the command here given to wives compared to children and to slaves. Children and slaves are commanded to obey. Wives are commanded to submit it's voluntary. And think about how that reverses the curse. Contrariness leads to strife. How different things might turn out if a wife voluntarily submits to her husband. To submit also means to recognize a relationship that God has established. And the second half of the phrase is, as is fitting in the Lord. To submit in this way is to adopt the posture of Jesus towards his father. But then comes Colossians 3.19, which is way less known as a verse. It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Now to us, that seems like a no-brainer. Of course, husbands should love their wives. That's just what you do. Not in Rome. 
not in Greek culture. Husbands ruled their wives and their children, and husbands often married for economic, political, or status reasons. This match would advance their careers, their wealth, their possibility of promotion. So it was common practice for Roman and Greek husbands to love women other than their wives. And this was not to be the case in Christian homes. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Or some of your translations might say, or do not be embittered with them. So husbands, do we think that we are justified in harshness or bitterness towards our wives? Do we think that because we had a stressful day at work, we are justified in giving our wife a blast because of our frustration? No. And I remember overhearing a conversation once where a husband received a call from his wife about some issue at home, and the husband treated his wife as an irritating interruption. He completely dismissed her concerns because he had way more important things to do and hung up on her. Such harshness is forbidden by God. Husbands need to repent of any harshness towards their wives. In fact, Paul demands much from husbands, especially in the parallel passage of Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Yes, wives are to submit to husbands and respect them in that passage. But husbands have five responsibilities in Ephesians 5. Number one, they are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Two, they must be willing to lay down their lives. Three, they must care for their wives as they care for their own bodies. Four, they must cherish their wives. Five, they must prioritize their wives by leaving their father and mother and becoming one flesh with their wife. So any husband who quotes, wife, submit to me, while neglecting his own massive responsibilities in marriage, needs to repent. And notice also that husbands love your wives reverses the curse of Genesis 3.16. Your husband will rule over you. One commentator writes, no other code from the ancient world that we have discovered requires husbands to love their wives. But God requires it and commands it. And when a husband takes their responsibilities seriously and lives them out by God's empowerment, it greatly increases the likelihood of a harmonious marriage. Now, we have just scratched the surface on this topic. And I'd invite you to join in our discussion group upstairs in about 15, 20 minutes, where we'll explore this further but to bring this home today, let's step back from these commands and look at the bigger picture of Colossians to gain some perspective as we conclude. Paul wrote, we must put on the new self that we receive because of Christ's sacrifice for us. And this new self involves authentic Christian living. Remember, we've been talking about authenticity throughout this series. And to live as authentic Christians, we have to think adopt Christ's new way of thinking. That's what Colossians 3 was all about that you heard about last week. And so my question to close our time today is this. Is God revealing to you some area in your thinking specifically about this issue that needs his renewing work? Is there sexism in your thoughts? Do you think the opposite gender is inferior to yours in some way? Is there something you do in marriage or a relationship that causes strife rather than harmony? Is there some attitude that God has pointed out that needs changing? Is there some wisdom that you need to deepen the closeness and harmony in your relationship and in your family? Is there some courage that you need to embrace this high calling that God has on husbands and wives. I want to give you just a moment with the Lord alone, and then I'm going to close our time in prayer.
And so, Lord God, we come to you asking for your help. Everyone here has experiences that affect our reaction to verses like these. Yet the complexity of all of that is not too much for you, Lord. And help us as a community to seek to strive to honor and glorify you and help one another in living out your commands, trying to figure out what this looks like in our lives, in our marriages, in our relationships. We pray against, Lord, the work of the enemy in Jesus' name. We pray against that to dis that discourages us, that causes strife in our marriages when he tries to use your word, and just as he did with Eve, tries to twist things, tries, mentions only partial bits of a command, casts doubt on your character. We pray against all of that in our church family, in the marriages, in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, for your empowering, for your strengthening, to live in a way that glorifies you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll continue to empower us and lead us and to guide us into all truth. And we thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness to us. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Our closing song today focuses on the power of Jesus and his name. And he is our hope. So will you stand together as we sing?